Welcome to National Parks Traveler, where we explore the national parks and the issues that involve them. This is Kurt Rappencheck, your host at National Parks Traveler. A possible 6,100 acre expansion of Big Bend National Park. The unfortunate closing of the Bluffs restaurant on the Blue Ridge Parkway after being open less than a week. And details on how national parks can serve as lesson material for homeschoolers. Those were just some of the stories we offered you at nationalparkstraveler.org this past week. In this week's show, we question whether national parks can serve as a barrier to slow the sixth mass extinction. Certainly, the large landscape parks, such as Yellowstone and Yosemite and Grand Canyon, offer the habitat many species require. But parks are slowly being hemmed in by development, making it harder and harder for species to follow their natural paths across the landscape. So can they slow the sixth mass extinction? We're going to be taking a look at that in the coming weeks and months, and today we'll lay out that proposal in an essay. But first, what can turn a five-day trip to Yosemite National Park into a one-day trip to Assateak Island National Seashore? COVID can. In this lighthearted and informative story of their trip to the beach, the travelers Lynn Riddick and her friend Michelle Hogan demonstrate that it's all about flexibility when trying to find some outdoor space in the age of a global pandemic. The North Cascades Institute has a large portfolio. It's an environmental learning center, a training center, a conference center, and a leadership center, all set in the splendor of the North Cascades National Park Complex. Learn more at ncascades.org. The Grand Teton National Park Foundation is a private, nonprofit organization that supports projects that protect and enhance Grand Teton National Park's cultural, historic, and natural resources. By funding initiatives that go beyond what the National Park Service could accomplish on its own, Foundation donors improve the visitor experience and provide benefits to the National Park System for decades to come. See their successes at gtnpf.org. We gave it our best shot but a trip to Yosemite National Park was just not in the cards for us in 2020. I had some business in Annapolis, Maryland, so I invited a college friend to join me there. Michelle Hogan and I became friends as freshmen on the same dorm floor at West Virginia University. So I'm sitting here with my friend Michelle Hogan <laughs> and she is one of my college friends. We went to college together. We were uh, freshmen together in the floor. And we're not going to say what year we graduated because we'd, we'd have to kill you. <laughs> but hi, Michelle. Hi, How's Lynn. it going today? I'm so excited to be here. I love Annapolis. I love the water, the boats, the seafood, the crab. Come on. <laughs> you can't get that in Colorado. <laughs> That's right. So Michelle lives in Colorado. She lives outside of Denver, and we converged in Annapolis, Maryland. And we're here to tell the story about how uh, our trip to Yosemite National Park <laughs> turned into a trip to Assateague Island National Seashore. <laughs> Curvy road. <laughs> so how did we start the planning to Yosemite? Yeah, I remember we were on a phone call, and we both had this uh, revelation when we were talking about travels that we would like to do, that we both wanted to see Yosemite, that neither one of us had traveled there. And I think we both sort of landed on the idea at the same time, well, why don't we do that together? It's like, hey, would, would you be interested? Yeah, well, let's do it. And so that was November of last year. And that's how it began. And then, you know, when you say yes to Lynn, it, it moves fast. <laughs> So it did move fast, after we decided on a date, and then another date, and then another. I touched base with Kurt Repenshek, who is, you know, uh, National Parks <laughs> Traveler's editor and executive director and founder. And he sent me a chart of uh, visitation to Yosemite by month. 
and it was really clear to avoid June, July, and August. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. And I think both of us were sort of wary about that too, like crowds we want to do, not avoid, but minimize crowds. Right, yeah. since we didn't have any, you know, school-aged children or anything yes. like that that we had to deal with. So uh, we decided to go in April knowing that, well, we might miss out a little bit of some of the, the, the falls. Mm-hmm. Yes. Uh, some of the trails might be closed, some of the roads might be closed, but we were willing to, you know, chance it. Yes, yeah. And so we, we set our air reservations. It was early April. And then <laughs> in March... <laughs> Um, it came to a screeching halt, yeah, with COVID. So being the eternal optimist, Lynn, <laughs> uh, <laughs> we decided to pause that and go to June. Surely this would be remedied <laughs> by June. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> um, and, you know, we all know what happened then. The park, well, the park closed, right? right. We went on the website and found out that Yosemite was closed. And, and we weren't going to travel anyway, even if it had been opened, I don't yes, think. Yes, I don't think so. It was too risky at that point. And so we paused that idea for 2021, and that's in the queue for 2021 travel. Well, wait, wait. Oh, oh Remember wait. Remember we shifted, we decided to shoot for August. Oh, that's right. <laughs> there was another tributary. <laughs> so we, we thought we would... Uh, plan a Yosemite trip for August. And that seemed to be a brilliant idea. And so we were shooting for that. But I couldn't, I couldn't get any reservations. The website to book the Wawona Hotel, the Yosemite Valley Lodge, and the other ones were just, you could get online and make a reservation, but it immediately locked you out. And there was no there was no hope of booking online. So I remember I called a couple of times and it appeared as though the reservation agent was going through the same process I was. They didn't have any secret backdoor ways to get on and book a reservation. They were having the same stumbles as I was. So that's when we decided to come east and come to Annapolis <laughs> and take it from there and push <laughs> and push Yosemite to 2021 April. Yes. Yes. Uh, yeah, we at that point we surrendered like okay, this isn't our path this year <laughs> to connect. And then Lynn suggested <clears throat> this beautiful part of the country that is Maryland and the waterfront and Annapolis and the Chesapeake Bay which is a hidden treasure. It's probably not hidden for people on the East, but I mean, my, um, I just had no no idea how verdant and historic it is here and just how welcoming. So uh, it's been a marvelous couple of days and Lynn, (laughs) when (laughs) being as organized as she is, when she was sending me a note saying these are the variety of things that we can do while we're here. On the list was Assateague National Seashore. And being landlocked in Colorado, anything to do with the ocean or close to it, the water, uh, I was game for. And of course, being outdoors with COVID as, as much as we possibly can. So here we are in Maryland. It's mid-August, and we decided to go to Assateague on a Monday, hoping for less traffic, both on the road and on the beach. Not only is the National Seashore a beautiful place with an incredibly diverse ecosystem, it has an interesting history as well. We got this idea to go to Assateague Island National Seashore. Michelle, you had mentioned you had been to the Maryland beaches before. What was? What do you remember about that? Yeah, I was, as a kid... Um... Growing up in Pennsylvania, we'd go on a family vacation every year, and they were modest vacations, you know, one working adult in the family, and so we would drive. I mean, that was the mode of transportation back in the, this was in the late 60s, early 70s, and so (laughs) we drove to Ocean City, Maryland. I don't remember how many years we did that. I don't know that it was our place to go every year, but I remember visiting there a couple of years. And it was, you know, that was back when 
these grand old hotels existed, and maybe they still do, but, you know, you walk into the lobby and it's marble and tapestry, and that wasn't a representation, though, of your your sleeping room. <laughs> that was just to... <laughs> Bait and switch. <laughs> that was, that's called, right, exactly. And so then we walk upstairs, it was called the Alvin Hotel. But as a kid, you know, none of that mattered. It was just the joy of the ocean and a new place and being with your family. And I was sharing with Lynn, that was where I got my first epic sunburn. (laughs) Uh, They didn't have SPF strengths that they do today, (laughs) up to 100. Uh, And, you know, being, you know, uh, uninformed, it was actually a cloudy day. So that was kind of the twist. Mm -hmm. But you can still be sunburned on a cloudy day, folks. (laughs) (laughs) And so, yeah, to re- recall that sweet memory and then be back here again today, not in the same place, but in the in the same area, it brings a flood of memories. So glad to be here. Oh, great. Yeah. Well, you know, having been born and raised in Maryland myself, yeah. I spent a lot of time as a child and in, in my early 20s even uh, in Ocean City, Maryland. And my family spent a lot of time in Assateague, because we would go there and we would camp. And it was a a cheap vacation. When you have a lot of kids, you pitch a tent and everybody's happy. So I have great memories from from my youth in Assateague. And the last time I was there was probably just maybe four years ago. Mm -hmm. I just took a day trip there, walked the beach with my husband, and I was really surprised. I think it was November and mm. there wasn't a soul on the beach, wow. you know, as far as the eye could see. It was a beautiful day in November. I remember I was interested in collecting um, smooth sea glass. I was going to look oh. for smooth sea glass, and I couldn't find any. Oh. In fact, I didn't see any trash, any plastic, nothing like that at all. It was just amazing. And so I'm really curious to see what we're going to find on our trip this time. Um, if we might see more trash on the beach, are we going to find more people? It mm. is summer now, and more families are you know, heading to the beach and looking for places, yeah. like you said, to be out of doors yes. and enjoy the great outdoors and enjoy the seashore. So we're going to find out. Stay tuned. <laughs> Aren't you ready to load it up? Yep, ready to roll. All right, ice Let's chest go. first. There we go. Oh, nice styrofoam. It's funny how much stuff you need for a day at the beach. Yeah. All of our lotions and towels and bug spray. Bug spray. <laughs> and chairs we'll just put in the back. All right. All right, hop in. <laughs> Woohoo! All right. Let's hit the road. Off we go. Yay! Assateague Island National Seashore is a 37-mile, skinny strip of a barrier island starting below Ocean City, Maryland, and extending in a southwest line until it meets up with the Chincoteague National Wildlife Refuge in Virginia and Tom's Cove Hook at the end of the island. With the Atlantic Ocean to the east and Cinepuxent, Newport, and Chincoteague Bays to the west, the island sits separated from the mainland accessible only by two bridges. We cross the Verrazano Bridge on the north end and head for the park entrance. Mention Assateague Island and one of the first things you usually hear is about the island's famous horses. We're not talking thoroughbreds though. Assateague's herd is feral and free roaming, typically stunted in height with bloated bellies. That's due to a diet of nutrient poor salt marsh grasses. And it doesn't take long to see a few. So we haven't even entered ah. the um, national park. We haven't passed the guard gate. And here we see some horses wow. or ponies alongside the road. They're small, aren't they? I'm surprised. I'd have, get, I'd have given them a wider berth than those bikers did. Me too. <laughs> Anything that bites and kicks, it's like, okay. Respect so, that. So our drive here was about two and a half hours from Annapolis, Maryland. And it's a beautiful drive, it's an easy drive. You drive through a 
lot of rural uh, parts of the eastern shore of Maryland. And just the drive alone is really beautiful. Good roads, smooth. Lots of um, farm stands along the way. All right, here we come. Astig Island National Seashore, nice. Maryland District. We are coming into the entrance of the park. And there's a oh, pony I... or a horse. Yeah. Stay back 40 feet from horses, the sign says. Wow. No lifeguard on duty, the sign says. Hmm. And here we are at the gate. There are about 10 cars in front of us waiting to pay to get into the park. Let's pick the lane that's shortest, right? Entrance fee, <laughs> private vehicle, $25. Okay. Per person, walk in and bicycle free. Hi. Good morning. Hey, how are you today? Good, how are you? Good. Do you prefer cash or credit? Whatever's easier okay. for you. $25. Here you go. Perfect, let me get the pass for you. Hey, so what are these solar panels for? Uh, they power the booths, um, the ranger station, and then there's some, um, a few buildings over here of lights. So we're basically self-sufficient. We actually put some back. The electric company usually pays us. <laughs> Fantastic. Oh, that's good to hear. Our first stop was tracking down a park ranger to give us an Assateague 101 and tell us more about the feral horses. Here's Matt Rowe. Yeah, Astig Island National Seashore is a, uh, a great place to uh, come and hang out for the day. It's a 37-mile-long barrier island. Uh, we have basically about two miles kind of sectioned off here that are basically for the, the, the public to come explore. Uh, when you do come here, it's a great area to come and just hang out on the beach. You can lay out, chill for the day. You can cook there. You can uh, even bring uh, drinks out and just spend the day hanging out on the beach. You can even come out there and do some surf fishing. Mm -hmm. You can uh, surf uh, if you're into surfing. A lot of great recreational activities out there on the beach. Uh, there's also a lot of great things you can do over on the bay side. Uh, in the bay, you can go kayaking, you can go paddle boarding. Uh, people go out there, they go clamming. Uh, they also uh, do some crabbing out there. And then if you are interested, you have a vehicle that's capable of driving out on the sand. We also have an over sand vehicle area, uh, which requires a permit and equipment in order to go out there. But once you have that permit, you are able to drive out along the sand and basically head all the way down to the Virginia border and kind of circle back around and be able to spend the day on the beach there as well. But what makes us really exciting and one of the main reasons why a lot of people come to Aztec Island National Seashore is to see the wild horses. They have been on the island for a very uh, long time, about over 300 years now. Uh, there's there's a, a few stories out there about them on how they actually came to the island. Uh, there's a story about a Spanish galleon that wrecked and that uh, Spanish galleon uh, was carrying some precious cargo, which were some horses, and those horses survived and basically swam ashore and they have lived here ever since. Uh, that is a story that a lot of uh, the locals will tell. There's a, there's a famous book out there that talks about that story. There's even stories about pirates and that they would come in through the bay here. It was a great spot to store their ships and possibly some of their treasures and even horses on the island. Uh, but research suggests more that when early settlers came over, this was a great spot to avoid taxes and having to put fences up. So settlers brought their livestock over to include sheep uh, and horses and over time those horses were just kind of forgotten left here and they grew wild and they have been here ever since. And so how many can you expect to see or how many total are here on uh, on the park? Yeah so we like to keep our horses between 80 and 100. We're around 75 right now. Every year uh, the, the horses bring in uh, new foals um, and in order to kind of keep that population in check we do do a form of birth control and that birth control is basically um, used with a um, high-powered uh, rifle and a dart and it's called PZP 
And um, basically, we have our uh, research team go out. Uh, they have almost like a detailed profile of every single horse that is on the island. So like, just like when you go to the dentist, they will pull up your chart and they're able to look at your teeth. We know the different markings, the different things to look for to be able to identify each horse. Uh, we have detailed information about them, and we know who has been given PZP before and who hasn't. Uh, basically, we allow each mare to have one foal, and then depending on our numbers, we will allow them to keep having foals. Or if our numbers start exceeding the numbers where they're getting a little too high, then we will start issuing that to the different mares. I understand there's a distinction between acetique horses and chincoteague ponies. We like to call them horses due to their uh, DNA. They have more horses in their DNA than they do ponies. They're not technically the height of a horse. They're slightly sh uh, shorter than a horse, which would make them a pony, but because of their DNA and the fact that they are mostly made up of horses is the reason why we call them horses. The Shingatig ponies are also technically horses as well, um, but the ponies is more of a historical term. They, they like calling them ponies. Uh, and there is a, a basically a large gate or fence at the border of the Virginia and Maryland line that separates the Maryland horses and the Virginia horses. Down in Virginia, they are managed differently. They do see a vet, I think uh, about twice a year. And then every year, I believe it's the last Wednesday of July, uh, they do the pony swim. Uh, so they get rounded up. They're basically marched through uh, the town of Shingateague and they are auctioned off. Uh, and those funds go to the local fire department there. So it's a big tradition there. It's something they do every year. Um, and so basically, really, the only difference really is, is that they actually see a vet. They're auctioned off. They are cared for it a little bit to where our horses here on the Maryland side are completely wild. They see no vet care. In addition to the wild horses on Assateague Island, there is an amazing biodiversity of creatures on land, in the air, in the water, and in the marshy muck. On the bay side, in and around the marshy areas and seagrass meadows, great white egrets and blue herons stroll unhurried, knee deep in the still water. Osprey fly overhead with a catch of the day in their talons. On the beach, blackback gulls soar along the shoreline. Sanderlings and threatened piping plovers dart along the water's edge, pecking at tiny clams when the waves recede. Horseshoe crabs sometimes wash ashore and get attention from startled kids. If you think this strange and scary looking creature seems prehistoric with its helmet-shaped carapace and long, spiny, sword-like telson, you're correct. The species has been around for 300 million years and it's a regular here on the beach in Assateague. All right, so we made it out to the beach. Oh. We are here at the South Ocean Beach, not too far from the main gate. We didn't have to go far to find a good spot. Plenty of people out here today. Michelle, impressions? Oh my gosh. It's really just, so it's a perfect day temperature-wise. There's a lovely breeze. And it's just, it's so pleasant to be at a beach where there isn't development. <laughs> uh, you know, high-rise condos behind us and the other thing I'm noticing is just how much fun people are having like kids are out enjoying the day and building sandcastles and laughing and it, I think for both of us Lynn it brings back a lot of childhood memories that we we experienced don't you think oh absolutely Park Ranger Rowe told us that the seashore has been extremely busy this season with a big increase in visitation over previous summers. Backcountry campgrounds here are closed for COVID, but the beach and bayside camping areas have been full. Rowe said there's a limit of 145 oversand vehicles and permits sell out early each morning. So I would say about 150 yards from where we're camped out on the beach is the section where the over sand vehicle um, section of the park is. And so walking down there, um, I would say the cars and vehicles are parked probably anywhere between 
30 and 50 feet apart from each other. So they're spaced out, but there's a lot. And you can kind of, as far as the eye can see, just see a lot of vehicles. So the park is busy today. The beach is busy. But it sure is beautiful. The sky is blue. There's really not any clouds overhead. <laughs> there's some on the horizon to the west, but they do not look like they pose any threat. I started a conversation with our neighbor on the beach. John Smith was enjoying the day with his family. So John, you're here, you're holding your little infant daughter. This is London. What brings you to the beach today? Uh, yeah. Family vacation. Yeah, we, uh, my mom's been here before. We came here actually when we were younger, me and my sister. Uh, but yeah, now I'm just bringing the kids out here, having a little family vacation, getting away for a little bit. Mm -hmm. Where are you from? Maryland. We're about to Maryland. Uh, St. Mary's County. Sure. It's like down south, uh, uh, almost almost down at the end. So how does it feel to be out here? You know, is it a nice break from having been shut up at home for so long? Yeah, I mean, I, I was working um, up until like last week. So, I mean, I've been out of the house the whole time, still, you know, working in construction and whatnot. But no, it's nice. I mean, this beach is real nice. Back home, we don't have beaches like this, with little horses running around and whatnot, and like the sand, sand dunes and whatever. It was pretty cool. Nice little vibe. So we're walking along the beach and uh, some guys called out to tell us to watch out for some fishing lines. And so we limboed under the fishing lines and thought we'd check in with the guys and see what they were trying to catch. One of the guys is Bryce Collingwood a senior at Maryland's Towson State University and seasoned Sir Fisher. He gave us the lowdown. So it looks like you have three lines in the water right now. We uh, do. Well, how's your day going? What are you trying to catch and what's your success been like? So we came out this morning at about 5 a.m. Uh, right before the sun came up. Uh, usually the fish bite early in the morning, so we come out here to try and get them on breakfast feed. Uh, a lot of times, in the morning it'll be high tide so you can kind of get the lines out into some deeper water. Uh, we didn't have any luck this morning. We went back, had some breakfast, came back and currently right now, yes, we have three lines in the water, all of which have a mixture of baits. We have squid, finger mullet on all the different rigs. They're set up differently uh, and all the rods are set up at different distances into the water. So we have about 50 yards, we have about 80 yards and we have about 100, 120 yards uh, trying to get different species. Maybe we'll get something to bite. Uh, we have a little bit of luck this morning. We had a kingfish just about three hours ago. Uh, it was about eight inches, pretty native to the area. Um, good eating, great fish if you want to catch good target species in the summer. We had a bluefish about an hour ago, a little small one. Uh, we're using it for bait currently to try and get some bigger bluefish. Those are also a big summer species. You see a lot of them around here. Uh, when a fish bites, you'll usually see the tip of the rod snap really quickly up and down, back and forth. When they're smaller, you won't really know you have a fish until you reel it in, which is what happened to us this morning. We reeled both these fish in, uh, not expecting anything, and we actually were like, whoa, okay, we have a fish on the line, let's handle it. But if it's a big fish, one worth keeping, one worth uh, tr actually trying to catch, you'll see the rod tip kind of snap up and down, uh, and you'll notice that, hey, we have a fish on, we need to attend that rod, and let's try and bring this fish in. Actually, I do think I have something on this line. I do. That looks pretty promising. I do have a fish on this line. There is a fish on this line. I believe so. Yep. First dibs on the flounder. Absolutely. <laughs> Legal inches for flounder here is 16 and a half, which is a little rare if you catch it out of the surf. A lot of times flounder like a lot, uh, a lot smoother surf. When surf's pretty rough, you're going to catch a lot of your, your hardier fishes, your blue fish. When it's colder, you catch your drums, your black and red drum. Uh, in the summer, most of the time out of a rough surf, it's bluefish and kingfish. They both like the shallow water uh, and, and the roughness of the waves. Although this is actually a pretty good fish. Wow, it's giving you a fight. It is giving me a fight. This is a small rod. Um, it's only, I'm only working about 10 pounds worth of drag here, and it's on eight pound test line. Uh, but it is giving me a pretty good fight. Well, don't let me uh, let you lose your no, concentration. No, don't worry. It's right here. <laughs> let me go down and grab it. And I'll, I'll come it. with you. Oh, sure. Oh, it looks like a kingfish. 
and a keeper. Oh wow, look at that. So this is the this is the Atlantic kingfish. Uh, extremely common to this area. Extremely edible and really good eating. Uh, it's similar texture to a flounder. These are, uh, we call it off a squid. This, this little white strip right here is a piece of squid. Um, these fish uh, are off the bottom, usually with these little, these little bright bulbs. You kind of catch them uh, every night, like you know, you, like you just saw off that. And um, this is a keeper size. Legal limit for kingfish is nine inches. And that's, that's almost a foot and a half right there. So that's definitely a keeper. Uh, really good eating. He has a nice purpley pink shimmer to he him. He does. These, these fish are really scaly and they're known for being really shiny in the water. So when you, when you catch a, a kingfish, usually you'll see it in, in calmer surf, you'll see it before you catch it because they shine really bright in the sun if they come up to the surface. Uh, but like you said, really purpley shine, uh, white when they come out of the water but a uh, beautiful fish. I mean, couldn't, couldn't ask for anything better than that right there. That's perfect summer catch. I think I brought you good luck. Yeah, you did, 100%. So how often do you come to Assateague? This is my first time in Assateague Island. No kidding. This is. Um, but you're uh, going to school locally in Towson. I am, so right out of Baltimore, this is our first time. We're actually camping on the island here, just uh, uh, down the road a little bit. But first time in Assateague Island, usually, um, the Hatteras Islands are where we kind of frequent, which is the similar, but uh, we sure. figured, hey, we come down and fish, give it a try, see what happens, and usually you can come up with a good catch just like that. So when did you, oh, oh no! <laughs> we dropped the fish. Yeah, well, Bryce dropped the fish. <laughs> we're, with, with kingfish, there, when there's one, there's many, so. Okay. I'm not too worried about that. And there you have just another story of the one that got away. I just know you're going to recatch that kingfish. Absolutely. I'm going to throw this line right back in and hopefully get him again. <laughs> You've got to tip your hat to Mother Nature for the gift that is Assateague Island National Seashore. Back in the 1950s, plans were in place to turn the island into a private resort community with 5,000 homes, plus highways, roads, and commercial buildings. But the Ash Wednesday Level 5 Extreme Nor'easter of 1962 struck the Atlantic coast hard, leaving a long trail of devastation and death. And though there wasn't much on Assateague Island at the time, its few roads and structures were wiped out. As a result, developers were no longer interested in this unstable tract of Barrier Island, so they sold the land to the federal government. And in 1965, the Maryland side of Assateague and waters surrounding the entire island became a national seashore. Now a million visitors each year enjoy the island's pristine beaches, bays, and marshes without having to look at any commercial development. During the late 1800s, many residents in the small villages around the island worked for the U.S. Life Saving Service, which operated four stations on Assateague between 1875 and 1915. The U.S. LSS was then combined with the Revenue Cutter Service to form the U.S. Coast Guard, consolidating operations at some 279 other life saving stations up and down the East Coast and along other U.S. coastlines and lake shores. And speaking of coastlines, it's time to get in the water. All right, the water felt great. You were like, a f you're just joyous, aren't you, <laughs> in the water? It feels really good. It does um, it? It, it yes. wasn't even really that cold to get in. Okay. And it felt so nice actually in the water. Just fabulous. Well, you started here and you ended up there. <laughs> you know, it's I, I kept looking for your head. I'm like, oh my God, I might need to do a Baywatch. <laughs> <laughs> Drifting is part of the deal. I, it was funny, I didn't feel like I was drifting at all. And then when I pulled out of the water, I'm like, oh, Where I'm am way I? down here. <laughs> I know, I watched you here and then slowly. But I, I had to look up now and then. I'm like, oh, where's Lynn's head? Then I'd see you. It felt great. It was, oh. you know, the waves are pretty big and yeah. it takes a minute to get past the breakers and yes. find that sweet spot where you can... Right spring over the waves and not get and clobbered just by them. <laughs> Do that float, right? With the rhythm of the ocean. 
which was, uh, that was so great to see you enjoy that so much. And there's usually one wave at the very end that just knocks pushes you out. You. <laughs> or you okay, roll takes up you on down. the beach like a starfish. <laughs> with, a, with a suit full of sand. And so the shadows get longer, and other beachgoers pack it up for the day. The tide comes in, and we have to move our chairs further away from the surf. Our day comes to a close, too. We planned a trip to see the mountains and waterfalls of Yosemite, and instead found ourselves on the other side of the continent, on a beautiful island surrounded by ocean and bays, teeming with life and constantly rearranged by wind, waves, currents, and tides. Not a bad change of plans. All right, so we're in the car and it's time oh, to leave. Sigh. <laughs> it's hard to leave. It was a beautiful day. It was relaxing and entertaining with <laughs> just humans <laughs> and dogs. And uh, we've got to see some horses as we exited uh, this afternoon, which was a little bonus. <laughs> what a treat it was to be here today. It was a beautiful day, and it was really nice to have a day where we felt normal. Yeah. Yes. Yes, and we met some nice people that just seemed happy to be at the beach and share that feeling of normalcy. All in all, we give a thumbs up to Assateague Island National Seashore. Come visit soon. <laughs> Listener and reader support make National Parks Traveler possible every day of the year. If you enjoy the Traveler's content, please consider a donation via nationalparkstraveler.org. Washington State is graced with three spectacular national parks, each different and special in their own unique ways. As the official nonprofit partner and the only philanthropic organization dedicated exclusively to supporting these parks through charitable contributions, Washington's National Park Fund has a mission to deepen the public's love for, understanding of, and experiences in Mount Rainier, North Cascades, and Olympic National Parks. Share your passion for these parks at WNPF.org. Acadia National Park is one of the 10 most popular national parks in the United States. It's also one of the smallest and most vulnerable. That's why Friends of Acadia exists. Friends of Acadia is an independent organization of passionate people inspiring those who love this magnificent park to make a real and lasting difference for Acadia. You can make a difference at friendsofacadia.org. The Blue Ridge Parkway Foundation is the primary nonprofit fundraising partner for the Blue Ridge Parkway. It is made up of people who have a deep love for this majestic road and want to ensure that its natural beauty and the experiences that it offers endure for generations to come. You can show your appreciation at brpfoundation.org. National park landscapes are some of the most biologically diverse in the United States but they are not immune from degradation. There's a common thread among an otherwise little connected collection of wildlife species. The passenger pigeon, ivory-billed woodpecker, woodland caribou, Puerto Rican shrew, sea mink, California grizzly bear, eastern cougar, and the southern Rocky Mountain wolf. These are just a handful of the more than 100 species that are now missing, or soon will vanish, from the nation's national parks the biological islands that Congresses and Presidents have set aside for special protection throughout the U.S. history. At a time when conservationists are calling for 30% of the world to be protected for nature, and when the E.O. Wilson Foundation warns that the world's incredible biodiversity is shrinking fast, existing national parks and potential parks can play a role in preserving nature and slowing the sixth mass extinction. But it could be a hard-won goal, as national parks and lands worthy of national park designation are being hemmed in by development and resource extraction. These are some of the battlegrounds that are key to nature's future. 
What happens when faunal species go extinct? How might parks be impacted by the loss of species now on the precipice of being lost? Can the national park system really slow the sixth mass extinction? How can the National Park Service act now before species vanish or parks become too small? These are simple questions, but their answers can be quite complex. Already, the toll from the loss of species throughout the national park system has been significant. Three decades ago, researchers noted that parks such as Yosemite and Mount Rainier had lost a quarter or more of their species originally found there. Smaller park units might have lost as much as 40% of their original species. Today's research on the impacts of climate change indicates it is all but inevitable that we will see the collapse of many more wildlife species than had been expected. Wolverines could blink out, polar bears, pikas, staghorn corals, salmon, leatherback turtles. And that's just a short list. With many species relying on the national parks for survival, where do things stand today in the national park system? What plant and animal species are we missing? And what are we in danger of losing? What can be saved? Why do we care when species are lost? Should we care? What's in it for Americans, those who visit the parks, live near them, and rely on ecosystems the parks nurture? How do Native Americans, whose cultural practices, beliefs, and history have many connections with species at risk, view the ongoing collapse? What public lands out there should be added to the national park system to protect nature? National parks and other protected areas are key to slowing that rate of extinction. In the United States, lands managed by the National Park Service are biological outposts that can help prevent the loss of plants and animals to anthropogenic extinction. From Everglades to Great Smoky Mountains, Grand Canyon to Yellowstone, Joshua Tree to North Cascades, these and their sister parks offer habitat, and in some cases, refugia, for species being squeezed out of place by human actions responsible for habitat loss, pollution, and introduction of invasive species. In 2018, Kenyan conservationist Richard Leakey wrote that he believes that protected areas such as national parks and national forests are the best targets if nature is to be protected. National parks contain some of the best protected habitat for many species, in large part due to the Park Service's mission to conserve the scenery and the natural and historic objects and the wildlife therein for future generations. And as human populations grow and encroach on habitat, park lands are expected to offer much-needed sanctuary for plant and animal species. But even these places are being pressured immeasurably more now than how the Park Service's proponents possibly could have imagined in 1916 when the agency was established. Climate change, energy development, even something as seemingly harmless as park visitation are impacting the parks and their wildlife. Many parks are being hemmed in and transformed into biological outposts. Some of those outposts are withering. That ecological constriction carries its own pitfalls, unfortunately. Many large animal species, elk, bison, mule deer, and bears, for example, are either migratory or have large home ranges that take them outside of parks. If they lose that ability to move, the odds of their extinction rise. Dr. William Newmark is a conservation biologist who has done extensive research on patterns of species extinctions in national parks in the United States and Tanzania. He believes that the future persistence of many mammal populations within Western North American parks, as well as the probability of extinct populations recolonizing the parks, is highly dependent upon human activities and land use practices adjacent to the parks. In the long term, he adds, a net loss of species will most likely continue, particularly if habitat adjacent to the parks is extensively modified. Areas considerably larger than most parks in western North America will need to be managed if the historical mammal faunal assemblages within the parks are to be reestablished. Economic and political winds have pulled and pried and pushed the parks and their natural resources at times into unnatural settings. There have been pressures to dull science and cater to economics or philosophies that run counter to the Park Service mission. 
What should be amended to the Park Service's century-old mission statement is a mandate that these places be left unimpaired for the survival of their native species. The accumulation of insults against wildlife and their habitats risk turning these natural places into being nothing more than open-air zoos, with park managers as their keepers, responsible for regularly inserting fresh genetics to avoid toxic inbreeding and removing invasive species. National parks need help if they are to succeed in helping slow the sixth mass extinction, and the general public and stakeholders must be alerted to issues that could impair parks and hasten species extinction. Some parks are being overrun in a search for oil and gas, Climate change is creating problems ranging from sea level rise to more frequent and devastating wildfires. Invasive species are wiping out native species. Just as threatening, if not more so, is the growing biological isolation of some parks as they are hemmed in by development. To protect and strengthen species populations, there must be greater connectivity between and beyond national parks to allow for population growth and assure genetic diversity. The question, however, is whether we have the will to ensure that connectivity. For The Traveler, this is Kurt Repencheck. That's our show for this week. We hope you enjoyed it. With August coming to an end and Labor Day weekend up next, summer seems to have passed surprisingly fast. If you can manage one last trip to the park system before it's gone, we hope you enjoy it and stay safe. For The Traveler, this is Kurt Repencheck. The composers and musicians at Orange Tree Productions have created a unique collection known as the National Park Series that has grown to include more than 30 CD titles. Composed against the backdrop of a park's sounds of nature, these musical scores will connect you with these beautiful places and take you there, at least in your mind. This collection is the number one selling National Park audio series in the world and provides the background music for National Park's Travelers podcast. Visit them at orangetreeproductions.com. Editing and production work for the National Park's Traveler podcast series is done by Splitbeard Productions. Find out more about us at splitbeardproductions.com. National Parks Traveler is a 501c3 nonprofit media organization that provides daily editorial coverage of national parks and protected areas. Traveler's coverage is made possible by reader and listener donations. Visit us at nationalparkstraveler.org.